The Lebanese Civil War would pit the various sectarian communities of Lebanon against each other, fighting over the character of their nation and its place in the wider region. It involved refugees from other regional conflicts, the machinations of superpowers and of regional powers. Over a 15-year period, between 100 and 150,000 people would die, and the Middle East would be transformed. The conflict was born out of how to deal with the Palestinian refugees living in Lebanon. The Lebanese government had not naturalized the Palestinians, thereby cutting them out of full participation within Lebanese society. Palestinians in exile formed terrorist groups such as the Palestine Liberation Organization, whose charter called for the unequivocal eradication of Israel. These organizations would infiltrate the Jewish state to commit acts of terrorism, almost exclusively targeting civilians. These groups made their homes among the Palestinian refugee communities of the region and would plot their attacks from within their confines. Every time Israelis were attacked by these groups, the IDF would retaliate against Palestinian terrorists. Unfortunately, because they made their homes amongst Palestinian civilians, it was impossible to retaliate against the terrorists without also hitting bystanders. The Syrian government and the PLO both knew this and developed a strategy to exploit it. Attack Israeli civilians and force them to retaliate, and when they do, cry foul that the attack was disproportionate and accuse them of orchestrating a holocaust against the Palestinians. The Arab states and the PLO intentionally put the lives of innocent Palestinians in danger for the sake of tarnishing Israel's reputation abroad. Hafez al-Assad saw no reason to be obliging towards the victors. Israel's salient stretching towards Damascus might prove difficult to defend if full-scale hostilities broke out again, and would require Israel to maintain a degree of mobilization that puts its economy under strain. He began a low-level war of attrition, using artillery duels and snipers. This was a war which he could always escalate when he chose, causing a corresponding increase in Israeli casualties on the Golan. He also rejected face-to-face -face meetings with the Israelis and refused to provide a list of Israeli prisoners of war. This was a very different approach from that of Anwar Sadat, his Egyptian counterpart, who quickly agreed to an exchange of prisoners and positively relished ceremonies in which Egyptian and Israeli officers met face-to-face -face and saluted each other. It was a sign of the rift that was developing between the two leaders. This tragic pattern resulted not only in the suffering of the Palestinians themselves, but also of their non-Palestinian neighbors in their host countries. It may be the case that the current Israeli policy of attacking Arab terrorist bases in southern Lebanon is another example of concentrating too much attention on preventing terrorist actions and too little attention on foiling terrorist purposes. The Israeli policy is certainly understandable on many grounds, and valid arguments can be adduced in its support. But the weakening of an essentially benevolent Lebanese government, as well as the further estrangement of world opinion, are results of the Israeli raids into Lebanon that may outweigh the value of using that particular approach to the problem of combating terrorism. Israel was in a no-win situation. If they continued to let the attacks happen over and over again, not only would Israeli citizens die, and Israeli property be destroyed, but the Israeli state would be delegitimized in the eyes of Israeli citizens for allowing it to happen. And if they did respond, they would inevitably hit bystanders, which would create international animosity toward the Jewish state and inspire more people to take up arms against them. These issues were exacerbated by the internal politics of Lebanon. Muslims were supportive of the Palestinian refugees and the PLO, while the Christians didn't share their antipathy for Israel and resented the Palestinians for not only threatening the demographic balances the state was built upon, but also for inviting Israeli reprisals. All sides began building up their own militias separate from the Lebanese military in order to protect their communities. So when fighting broke out in April 1975, everyone was prepared. Funding for the civil war came from many sources. Both the Palestinians and Maronites had diaspora communities who sent remittances back to their homelands or generally donated to various organizations disguising themselves as charities in the West. By 1975, the PLO's budget was bigger than that of the Lebanese government, and the economic activity of the Palestinians made up about 15% of Lebanon's GDP. There was also plenty of money pouring in from the Gulf monarchies, who were flush with cash due to the spike in oil prices after the embargo during the Yom Kippur War. Many Lebanese also worked abroad in the Gulf, sending home both money and ideas. 
little, we realized that the front line was a focus, that it was important to the Lebanese, the only way to define the undefinable, the only method by which those who had suffered, which meant every Lebanese, could uniquely understand the nature of the calamity that had come upon them. In 1976, their government had sent trucks to clear the streets, and the airlines and banks had started to reconstruct their offices. Then the war destroyed it all again. In 1982, the French army had collected the unspent ammunition lying in the rubble and defused unexploded shells. In 1983, the Lebanese Saudi entrepreneur Rafik Hariri had paid millions of dollars for the restoration of the city center. Then the fighting had resumed and the streets were reseeded with mines. In truth, the Beirut front line could not be repaired, restructured, rebuilt, or re-roofed because it had become necessary to the Lebanese. It was a reference point without which the tragedy could not be expressed. It represented the cruelest of all front lines, one that lay deep within the minds of all who lived in Lebanon and all who came there. The fighting began on April 13th after a group of Palestinians attempted to assassinate Pierre Jamail, the leader of the Kateb party and the Phalangist militia. The Phalangists retaliated by massacring a busload of Palestinians returning home from a victory parade held in West Beirut, celebrating a recent terrorist attack in Israel. As word of both the assassination attempt and the bus massacre spread across Beirut, Phalangist militias and PLO began to clash. President Suleiman Frangia met with Hafez al-Assad to discuss how to stop the Israeli attacks. At no point did they ever discuss getting the PLO to stop attacking Israel, which was by design. The Cairo Agreement of 1969, signed by President Charles Hallou and Gamal Abdel Nasser, forced Lebanon to give de facto sovereignty to the Palestinian camps. On the ground, this meant that the PLO became the governing body over the camps. They guarded them, recruited fighters, and kept Lebanese law enforcement out. You see, the Israelis weren't the only ones the PLO were attacking. PLO gangs also attacked Lebanese citizens as well as foreigners in the country. One must admit that the Palestinians themselves, by violating the Lebanese law and carrying arms and functioning in a police role at the entrances to the capital, have facilitated the preparation and conception of the conspiracy. In certain cases, Palestinian patrols used to arrest government employees and director generals to check their identification, and in other cases, Lebanese and foreign residents were kidnapped and imprisoned. These violations taken lightly at first became unbearable. Palestinians should have collaborated with the Lebanese authorities so that lawbreakers who take refuge in the Palestinian camps cannot escape the law. Had there not been this degree of transgression or violation of law, we would not have seen this level of outrage. The Christians grew particularly angry at the Palestinians because they did not remain neutral in Lebanon's politics. Previously, we used to resort to political pressure only as the only means for reform and equity. Then the Palestinian cause emerged, and we found ourselves united with the Palestinians because together we form one ideology. We and the Palestinians are one in terms of Arab identity, religion, and nationalistic views. The Christians weren't the only ones angry at the Palestinians. The Shia who lived in the Bekaa Valley in southern Lebanon also suffered from the Israeli retaliations. Musa Sadr urged the Lebanese state to redress the plight of the southern Lebanese, but to little effect. As an Iranian trying to make headway in an Arab environment, he found it expedient to publicly and repeatedly declare his antipathy toward Israel and his support for the right of the Palestinians to win back their homeland. Yet despite his declarations and genuine feelings of sympathy for the Palestinians, Sadr could see that the actions of the PLO were bringing ruin and misery to his constituents in South Lebanon. He found it increasingly difficult to reconcile his sympathies for the stateless Palestinians with the reckless behavior of the PLO in the South. As the fighting spread, the apparatus of government began to fall apart. The Lebanese army and civil service began to fracture along sectarian lines only defending or servicing their communities. The Israelis backed one of these officers, Saad Haddad, who took control of a Christian enclave along the southern border with Israel. 
which made it easy for the IDF to funnel weapons and supplies to his forces. This became known as the Good Fence Policy. This was not an unusual practice for Israel. They had a history of supporting ethnic or religious minorities against hostile Arab governments. Having supported the Kurds in Iraq, the Yemenites against the Egyptians, as well as the Christians in Sudan against the Arab government in Khartoum. The Israelis felt a kind of kinship with the Christians of Lebanon. They were both ethnic and or religious minorities surrounded by a hostile Arab Muslim majority. Seeing the erosion of their position, the Lebanese Christians took a stand to defend their heritage, while Syria lay in wait to extend its hegemony over Lebanon and realize its dream of a greater Syria. In the eyes of the Rabin government, supporting the Maronites in Lebanon was a logical extension of this policy. If it was in Israel's interest to help the Kurds 600 miles away and the Ethiopians over a thousand miles away, no one had any doubt about the need to support the Christians who were fighting for their lives against the PLO on our very doorstep. And it is in my interest to tell you all about this video's sponsor, Fire and Maneuver. Fire and Maneuver is the premier game from Armchair Historian Interactive, from the same creators of the Armchair Historian YouTube channel. If you enjoy the aesthetics of an Armchair Historian video, then you will love the look of it. It's a turn-based strategy game, where you take control of a 19th century army and battle it out with other militaries from the time period. However, unlike most turn-based strategy games, this one doesn't have you sit around and watch as your opponent attacks you without the ability to respond. Both players give their orders simultaneously, giving you a chance to predict your opponent's movements, so you can fire and outmaneuver them on the field of battle. And best of all, it's free to play on Steam. There will be DLC for the game in the future, but all of it will be purely cosmetic. Nothing will be pay to win. So if you want to support the developers, you can do so. I hope to be playing this game more myself in live streams here on YouTube and on my Twitch. So subscribe to my channel or follow me on Twitch to see more of that. And go ahead and go on over to Steam. It's free to play and you've got nothing to lose. Thanks again to Fire and Maneuver and Armchair Historian Interactive for sponsoring this video. But for now, let's get back to the history. The first fights were between Palestinian and Phalangist militias in the streets of Beirut, Tripoli, and Sidon. The Palestinians and their Lebanese allies targeted Maronite-owned businesses, while Phalangists targeted the Palestinian camps. There were no firm battle lines, and barricades were hastily thrown up. The Arab League managed to secure a ceasefire on April 16th, but no one knew for how long. Maronite leaders began resigning their positions in President Frangia's government after leaders of the Lebanese National Movement, a coalition of Muslim and leftist factions led by Druze leader Kamal Jumblat, sought to have the army disarm Phalangist militias, while their own militias remained armed. Fighting resumed shortly thereafter, with former President Camille Chamoun and Kamal Jamblat leading the respective sides. President Frangia tried to get a new government formed, but prime ministers kept resigning. Rashid Karami managed to secure another ceasefire on June 30th, after forming a new cabinet consisting of a member from each major sect. The Maronites wanted to provoke the Palestinians into breaking the ceasefire so they could justify expelling them from the country. Jumblat made sure to place the LNM militias between the Phalanges and the PLO so as to prevent such provocations. In the negotiations, Kamal Jumblat and the LNM demanded that Christians and Muslims have equal representation in parliament, and that confessional monopolies over cabinet offices be abolished. All other reforms were secondary and presumably achievable if the former were achieved. The Maronites, who saw Sunni and Arab populism as threats to their power and rights, opposed these reforms. While the Sunnis, leftists, and Palestinians were fighting against the Maronites, the Shia were putting up a pacifist facade. They had managed to keep their own militias a secret from the others, all the while receiving training from the PLO in cooperation with Syrian officials. Musa al-Sadr had made a big show of protesting the civil war and the militias by going on a hunger strike but a training accident in early July resulted in over 30 casualties among Sadr's Amal fighters. He claimed his militias were for protecting the Shia community in southern Lebanon from the Israelis, but nobody was buying it, and Sadr was now seen as a hypocrite. The June 30th ceasefire ended on August 24th, when fighting broke out between Amal and Phalangist in the Beka Valley. August 29th saw fighting break out in Tripoli between the Zagarta Liberation Army and the PLO with Sunni militias. The ZLA was led by Tony Frangia, the son of President Suleiman Frangia. Prime Minister Karami tried to stop the fighting with the Lebanese army, but after it killed Sunni militiamen, the army lost all Muslim support. 
In response to the death of the militiamen, Kamal Jumblah called for a general strike on September 15th in protest. Jumblah also reached out to Assad for aid, who would send the Palestine Liberation Army to Tripoli. The Palestine Liberation Army, or PLA, were Syrian organized divisions of Palestinian troops and were functionally extensions of the Syrian military. Assad used them when he wanted to pursue Syrian foreign policy goals without dragging Syria itself into war. Hafez sent his foreign minister to Beirut to form a committee to resolve the fighting. The committee agreed to a new ceasefire on September 25th, which broke down on October 22nd, and the army was unable to contain the hostilities. Hafez sent in more PLA forces to Beirut in agreement with Prime Minister Karami, but President Frangia opposed this move, fearing it would exacerbate the tensions between the Maronites and the Palestinians, especially when the PLA were so obviously Syrian proxies, and foreigners in Lebanon felt trapped by the interests of outside powers. As the violence reached paroxysm after paroxysm, and the world watched with indifference, or at best revulsion, even while feeding it with more weapons, I have felt as much impatience with what the world as anger at invading armies, local warlords, and anonymous car bombers. Outsiders look at Beirut from a wary distance as though it had nothing to do with them. They speak of Beirut as if it were an aberration of the human experience. It is not. Beirut was a city like any other, and its people were a people like any other. What happened here could, I think, happen anywhere. The phalanges began to push into the Muslim and mixed neighborhoods of West Beirut, but were pushed back by the LNM. Kidnappings and massacres became common. Militias began attacking Muslims and Christians in downtown Beirut at random. Another ceasefire was accepted on December 15th after military threats were made by Syria and the PLO. At this point, both sides began to eliminate hostile areas within their own enclaves. Maronite militias blockaded Palestinian camps and destroyed Muslim slums in East Beirut. Fatah and the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine ended their faux neutrality and formally sided with the LNM. Palestinian and LNM militias attacked Christian towns along the coast. The PLO would be the first to introduce heavy artillery into the fighting, whereas before it consisted mainly of rifle and small arms fire. This forced the Lebanese into bombing the Palestinian positions. Muslim militias from Sudan advanced north to help capture the Christian port city of Jia. The Maronites captured Karantia and Maslak, while the Muslims and Palestinians captured Damor. Most of the Christian residents of that city had fled, but those left behind were massacred. In the more rural areas, Sunni tribesmen raided Christian villages. In Tripoli, the ZLA fought against the Sunni militias and the PLO. And in the Bekaa Valley, Amal militias and the PLO attacked Christians, and Syria would send more PLA to join them. By 1976, Lebanon was in a virtual state of anarchy. Government buildings were subject to attacks by mobs and arson, inmates were released from prisons, migrants and refugees began to occupy empty homes and apartments in West Beirut. His failure to stem the disintegration resulted in Prime Minister Karami resigning on January 18th. President Frangia asked Syria for help, who were able to establish a new ceasefire on January 21st. That same day, Lieutenant Al-Hitab of the Lebanese army mutinied and formed his own militia, the Lebanese Arab Army, or LAA, which sided with the Muslim and Palestinian militias. In March, the Sunni Brigadier General Aziz al-Adab led a coup against President Suleiman Frangia and demanded that he resigned, but the president refused. At this time, the Christian militias began to organize themselves under a unified command, calling themselves the Lebanese Forces or Lebanese Front under the leadership of Bashir Jamal, the son of phalangist leader Pierre Jamal, They began advocating a partition of Lebanon into separate Christian and Muslim states, which the Muslims, Palestinians, and Syrians opposed. The Maronites were receiving support from Maronite businessmen abroad, as well as the pro-American Arab states such as Egypt and Saudi Arabia. The Muslims received their arms from the Syrians, who in turn got them from the Soviets. The Syrians feared that if the civil war dragged on too long, the Israelis might intervene. So when the LAA began besieging the Christian towns of Andaka and al kabaya Assad was asked to intervene by those communities. So the Syrians got President Frangia to sign on to constitutional reforms, which ordered the distribution of seats in parliament be equal between Muslims and Christians, and for the election of prime minister to be handled by parliament, rather than appointed by the president. But to the LNM, these reforms were insufficient. PLO leadership also began to fear the Syrian presence might threaten their autonomy, because despite the PLO and Syria being nominally allies, they both wanted to control Lebanon for themselves. 
The first objective was to obtain gradually full control over Lebanon by installing certain kinds of puppet rulers who will be in harmony with the Palestinians, the actual rulers. However, another objective evolved while work on the first was going on. Their second objective was to establish a Palestinian homeland, a part of which will be in the south of Lebanon, of a size dependent on the magnitude of their victory over the Lebanese. At this point, the Palestinians and the leftists were winning the civil war in Lebanon. But Assad feared the PLO gaining too much autonomy, because he wanted them to remain dependent on Syria. And this is the real reason for Syria's intervention into the Lebanese civil war. By early April, the LNM-LAA-PLO alliance controlled two-thirds of Lebanon, consisting of all the lowlands added by France during the mandate period. Assad responded by sending in more PLA into Lebanon and attempted to break up the PLO-LNM alliance, but failed, to which he then sent in even more PLA. Assad called on President Frangia to resign, but once again, the president refused. The Maronites reached out to the U.S. for protection, but after Vietnam, the U.S. was in no mood for foreign wars, nor was France, or any country in Western Europe due to their dependence on Arab oil. Since the Yom Kippur War, the Arab states had been using the threat of oil embargoes to get Western countries to cut off support to Israel, and to coerce them into working with the PLO, whom the Arab League had declared the only legitimate representative of Palestinian interests in 1974. The Maronites also considered reaching out to Israel, but they knew this would alienate Assad, who was, for the time being, holding the Islamists, Arabists, and Palestinians back from total victory. They reached out to President Frangia and decided to openly endorse the recent constitutional reforms in exchange for his support. Now this was supported by Assad, who got the PLA to switch sides to the Lebanese front in exchange for the Maronites in parliament voting for his presidential candidate, Elias Sarkis, along with the traditionalist leaders of both factions. Jumblah and the LNM initially supported the move, preferring the Maronites to be dependent on an Arab power rather than a Western one, or even worse, on Israel. Assad's goal in Lebanon was to re-establish the pre-crisis status quo, in which the PLO were dependent on his support and would continue to attack Israel, who would subsequently retaliate and then turn the world against it. On May 8th, Sarkis would be elected president. However, constitutionally, Frangia's term didn't expire until September 1976, and he refused to step down until then, which threatened negotiations between the Maronites and Muslims. Syria was inching towards intervention in Lebanon, but they had additional worries, namely Israel. It found itself in a no less uncomfortable position regarding Israel. Because the involvement of the Syrian army in Lebanon inevitably weakened its deployment along the ceasefire line in the Golan Heights. At the same time, it was clear that if the Syrian army occupied southern Lebanon, we would be forced to take pragmatic steps to push it back. Israel could not tolerate having Syrian troops stationed along two of her borders. Syrian troops would enter Lebanon on June 1st, with the intent of weakening the PLO and LNM, giving the Lebanese government a chance to re-establish a standing army. Behind the scenes, they negotiated with Israel, using the US as an intermediary. They agreed to a red line in Lebanon, which limited the size of Syrian forces and forbade Syria from placing surface-to-air missiles in Lebanon. It found itself in a no less uncomfortable position regarding Israel. Because the involvement of the Syrian army in Lebanon inevitably weakened its deployment along the ceasefire line in the Golan Heights. At the same time, it was clear that if the Syrian army occupied southern Lebanon, we would be forced to take pragmatic steps to push it back. Israel could not tolerate having Syrian troops stationed along two of her borders. The fighting intensified to the point where foreign officials were now at risk in Beirut. On June 16, 1976, U.S. Ambassador Francis E. Meloy Jr. was assassinated. Two days later, President Ford ordered the evacuation of U.S. citizens from Lebanon, an inverse of the Eisenhower administration's actions nearly 20 years earlier. As the Syrians invade, intense fighting breaks out around Beirut, Tripoli, Sidon, between the Latani and Awali rivers, and Mount Hermon. The Syrians overpower the LNM and PLO forces along the Damascus Beirut Highway. Christian militias attack hostile Muslim enclaves in their territories, and the Syrians disrupt the LNM PLO supply lines. The Maronites also begin an offensive against the Palestinian camps of Tal Zatar and Jisir Bashar, 
Much of the Arab world had opposed Syria's intervention into Lebanon. On June 23rd, the Arab League met in Riyadh to approve of an Arab peace force to replace Syrian troops. The LNM and PLO supported the Arab League intervention, while the Lebanese Ba'ath Party began to turn on Assad. The Arab world and the Soviet Union would condemn Syria for its cooperation with the US and Israel. Hafez tries to turn this narrative around in a speech on July 20th, in which he claims that the Lebanese civil war was a plot by Zionists and imperialists to commit genocide against the Palestinians and partition Lebanon into Israeli puppet states. He declares that Lebanon is rightfully part of Syria, and therefore he was obligated to intervene to protect the Lebanese from Israeli aggression. In contrast to Assad's claims, Yasser Arafat claimed that the Palestinian resistance had nothing to do with the conflict in Lebanon. By July 22nd, the Syrians had achieved most of their initial goals by weakening the PLO enough to ensure their dependency on Damascus. The Syrians got the PLO to approve the recent constitutional reforms, which they had initially opposed, fearing it would weaken support for their cause among Lebanese Muslims. This deal also included President Frangia, who agreed to restore the Cairo Agreement, and, on paper, the pre-crisis status quo. Bashir Jamal begins to consolidate his authority over the Maronite factions after the fall of the Tal Zatar camp to Phalangis on August 12th, in which 3,000 Palestinians were killed. Elias Sarkis finally became president on September 23rd. He was widely viewed as a puppet of Hafez al-Assad never making any serious decisions without approval from Damascus. On October 26th, an Arab League summit again called for an international Arab force to replace the Syrian troops, to which Assad finally agreed. This new body, known as the Arab Deterrence Force, or ADF, would have 30,000 troops, 90% of which would be made up of the Syrian forces that were already in Lebanon. Functionally, this just meant that the other 10% would be reinforcements from other Arab states. Syria also arranged a new ceasefire with the LNM, which called for the Cairo Agreement to be back in force, as well as for the new ADF to be placed in Syria by November. Once in the country, the ADF was supposed to be under the command of President Sarkis, but the Maronites did not support this ceasefire, not trusting the Arab League to be a neutral arbiter, especially because Sarkis was widely seen as Assad's puppet. As of November 1976, the LNM, PLO, LAA, and Syrians are now all allied with the Lebanese government, while the Maronites grew more apprehensive. They continued to hold their enclaves in East Beirut, as well as communities north of the capital. The Israelis continued to support Saad Haddad in southern Lebanon, who was actively fighting against the PLO for control of southern Lebanon. In January of 1977, the Maronite factions held their own conference to discuss how they should respond to the Syrian government's agreements with the Muslim, Palestinian, and leftist factions. They came to three main points. First, they refused to comply with the Cairo Agreement. Second, they called for the expulsion of the Palestinians from Lebanon and for them to be resettled in other Arab League states. And third, they refused to cooperate with the Arab Deterrence Force. As the Syrians solidified their position in Lebanon, more Christian officers in the Lebanese army began to defect and set up their own militias, taking control of pockets along the southern border with Israel. The IDF would send weapons and other aid to these militias as well, using them as a frontline defense against PLO raids, expanding on the good fence policy. On March 16th, Kamal Jamblat was assassinated. Jamblat did not support a long-term occupation of Lebanon by Syrian forces, and it is suspected that Assad had him killed. Kamal was succeeded by his son, Walid Jumblat, who became the new leader of the Progressive Socialist Party and the LNM. And in this position, he bent the knee to Assad. Despite all of the evidence that it was Assad who had Kamal killed, the Druze blamed the Christians for his death, and in retaliation, they slaughtered Christian communities within their enclaves on Mount Lebanon. After having weakened the PLO enough to no longer pose a threat to the Syrian aims, Assad resumed aiding them again in southern Lebanon, who fought against the Maronite militias along the southern border. Back in Israel, a worsening economic situation, along with numerous scandals in the Rabin government, resulted in the political right gaining a majority of seats in the Knesset for the first time in the country's history, in May 1977. This political revolution was led by Menachem Begin, a former member of the Ergun and the head of the Likud party. 
The policy of retaliating against PLO terror attacks with commando raids and bombing runs was common practice under the prior left-wing governments. But under Begin and Likud, the IDF would take a more active role in the fight against the PLO, and they would reach out more to the Lebanese front, led by Bashir Jamal, who were more receptive to Israeli aid after the Syrians resumed arming the PLO in the south. In July of 1977, another summit of the Arab League called for the PLO to pull further back from the border with Israel, and to let the Lebanese army and the ADF replace them along the border. The Maronites opposed this because it legitimized the PLO as a negotiating partner with the Lebanese government, all the while they were being allowed to govern Lebanese territory. The Israelis also opposed this measure because it would make retaliating against the PLO targets more difficult. The various ceasefires began to break down in late summer. Christian militias capture Qiyam and the PLO resumes firing Katusha rockets into northern Israel. The newly elected President Jimmy Carter in the US had an acute interest in the Middle East and was trying to negotiate a ceasefire between the various factions. In his memoirs, he is quite critical of the Begin government's bombing of Lebanon, although he fails to mention that this policy was a holdover from previous labor governments and were in retaliation for terrorist attacks and rocket fire into Israel. Carter's plans were a tad ambitious, believing that he could resolve all the conflicts in the region with a big peace conference. We still had two basic problems in setting up the Geneva meeting. The Arabs wanted maximum Palestinian participation, but the Israelis wanted none. And the Soviet Union was reluctant to alienate any of its Arab friends or to deal fairly with Israel. Despite the failure of his Geneva plan, he was able to mediate a temporary ceasefire on September 25th. But the fighting would resume in November. The Cold War between Syria and Egypt would take a decisive turn in Syria's favor, when Anwar Sadat visited Jerusalem in the fall of 1977. Sadat was seen by many as a traitor to the pan-Arabist cause by negotiating with Israel. This led more Arab and Islamist groups to look to Assad for leadership. But in Beirut, the Maronites had become more hostile to Assad, holding anti-Syrian demonstrations in North Beirut. These resulted in clashes between the Maronite militias and the Syrian ADF. In January of 1978, President Assad began pressuring President Sarkis to sign a defense treaty with Syria so he could keep Syrian troops in the country after the ADF mandate ended. But in February, the Lebanese army, under the command of Antoine Barakat, an ally of former President Chamoun and the National Liberal Party, attacked ADF troops at Fayadiyah. The ADF responded by attacking the National Liberal Party headquarters and other Christian neighborhoods in East Beirut. Another ceasefire is signed to end the fighting. Syria begins pushing the PLO back into southern Lebanon by sending in Asakai, the militant wing of the Palestinian Ba'athist Party, which was part of the PLO, and who managed to capture Maroon Ross. The civil war would escalate again in the spring of 1978. On March 11th, a bus carrying Israeli civilians was attacked on the coastal highway near Tel Aviv by 11 PLO terrorists from Fatah. The massacre resulted in 48 deaths, 13 of which were children, along with another 76 people injured. Prior to that attack, they had hijacked taxis, murdering their occupants, and drove down the highway until they found a bus, firing at cars and throwing grenades indiscriminately along the way. Israeli police responded to the attack. Nine of the 11 PLO were killed in the rampage. They came here to kill Jews. They intended to take hostages and threatened, as the leaflet they left said, to kill all of them if we did not surrender to their demands. We shall not forget, and I can only call upon other nations not to forget that Nazi atrocity that was perpetrated upon our people yesterday. I want to give another quick thank you to this video's sponsor, Fire and Maneuver, available on Steam now. I'd also like to thank my patrons for helping make this video possible. Their support allows me to help make more videos like this, bigger projects that require more time and research. And if you think I got something wrong in this video, then tell me down in the comments below, but make sure you're specific about what. Because if you just say you got things wrong, I'm just going to assume that you're disagreeing with my interpretation of the story rather than the actual facts in it. And if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more, and help this channel get to 100,000 subscribers by the end of the year, then click that subscribe button. And you can even click the bell icon along with it as well to make sure you don't miss the next installment of this series on the Lebanese Civil War. It's gonna be more than two videos as you can probably already tell. So thanks so much for all of you watching and I will see you next time.